Well, with that, we'll jump in here. We're going to be in the book of uh, Romans today. You can cheat ahead if you want to open your Bibles or if you've got... uh, if you've got iPhones or iPads or whatever you brought with you today with a Bible on it, feel free to use that. But now, thinking about your day as things got started today, um, we have many decisions that we make in any given day, right? You, you, you've already made a whole bunch of decisions today, probably. Like, if you were like me, you set an alarm to get up in the morning. I don't have roosters. I don't wake up with the sunlight. I need an alarm. In fact, Sunday mornings, and, and, and I'll tell you what, Pastors don't sleep well on, sun, on Saturday nights into Sundays because there's this, I mean, there's always a tension. That, that's a little bit of it. But there's the big fear, what if my alarm doesn't go off? Now, I'm not kidding. This is a weekly battle as a pastor. So I woke up this morning at 6, looked at my phone because my phone is my alarm clock, right? Looked at my phone, 6.11. All right, I can sleep a little while longer. A little while later, I wake up, 6.40. Oh, I got a few more minutes to sleep, you know. 7.10. Oh, I can squeak in a few more minutes before this alarm goes off. And finally, the alarm goes off. And, and I set two alarms, right? I don't set just one alarm. I set two alarms because, I mean, hey, if I don't show up, what are we going to do? Have a good church service, I suppose. It'll be quick. But that's, that's one of the things we go through. So we've got to make those decisions. What time are we going to get up, right? And, and you might have had an opportunity. Do I hit the snooze button? Are you one of those snooze button people? Those of us who are not snooze button people, we don't appreciate you, by the way. I had a college roommate who would snooze button for hours. I don't understand the snooze button. I don't understand its function. When the alarm goes off, get up, right? But I know not everybody does that. But you had to do, are we going to hit the snooze button, 10 more minutes of sleep, and then once you got out of bed, you know, now I've got to get out of my jammies. The jammies are comfortable, but I've got to put clothes on, so what am I going to wear? And then... What am I going to eat for breakfast? And if you pick cereal, and who, who ate cereal for breakfast? Anybody? Yeah, a few of you, right? Okay, how, how many of you have paid attention recently as you walk through Paul Beck's or any grocery store for that matter to the number of choices of different cereals? It's overwhelming, folks. I mean, there's like a whole aisle of boxes of cereal that the main ingredient is largely the same in all of them. It's just what color and how much sugar are they going to dump into it is your primary choices on most of them, right? Anybody have cookie crisp this morning? That's one of my favorite. I don't buy it, but it's good. So, so you had to choose which cereal, right? You had to choose that kind of stuff. Uh, we have a lot of decisions that we have to make. And then you had to decide, okay, now that I've eaten breakfast, am I going to church? And if so, I'm going to go to church early. I'm going to get there early enough to have some coffee. There might be some cookies. Might be somebody to talk to, right? We we have that going on. So you had to choose, am I going to do that? And then, then of course, you had to decide, where am I going to sit? Well, maybe you didn't have to decide that. How many of you have been sitting in the same seat for more than at least five years, right? Yeah. (laughs) Maybe that's no longer a decision in your life. But for some of us, we had to decide, where are we going to sit, right? And And you had to decide... Can I squeeze in one more cup of coffee? Do I have to squeeze in a quick trip to the bathroom or anything like that? And then here we are, right? We're finally, we're here, we're in here, we're ready to go, ready for worship. But it's decisions, 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 decisions. Life as an adult, adulting is making decisions, right? Now we all have some big decisions to make this week. You know, things we've been thinking about sometimes for months. Maybe, maybe you're one of those who last week you had to think through just how much money am I going to spend at this fair, right? Any of you parents have to make that decision this week? How many rides? How many corn dogs? How many cheese curds? How many bus races are we going to go to, right? So, so you have to make those kinds of decisions. Or maybe you've got to make a decision about your 401k or your retirement. Or maybe you've got to make a big financial decision. Maybe you're selling a house, right? We're selling a house and maybe we're buying a house. Maybe we need a new car. Lots of decisions to be made. Lots of things that are going on. Lots of things where we have to decide what is the best for us? What is the best for the others in our lives? What is the best for our future? What should I do about this decision? Being adult sometimes is hard. Now this fall, we're going to have some tough decisions to make again, right? Now I'm not preaching politics, but we've got to vote. 
as Christians, we've been empowered as voters in the United States to exercise our, our rights to select who we think is the best candidate, or as some might say, the least of the worst. It depends on your opinions. But that's not the point. The point is, we have to make decisions. And the issues are complicated, right? Where do they stand on foreign policy? Where do they stand on finances? Where do they stand on social security? Where do they stand on whatever, right? So we have to weigh these things, think these things through. Political, social, economic issues. Now, imagine if we could just have some simple rules, right? Some easy indicators, some, some things that could help us prioritize, some things that could help us have clarity, some things to help us make decisions. Well, that's what we're going to be talking about in the three, next three sermons is this process, these simple rules for life. You see them on the screen here. The first one and the one we're talking about this week is do no harm. Very providential considering the week our nation has had this past week. I picked this quite some time ago as our series coming up here. But the first one is do no harm. The second one is do good. And the third one, stay in love with God. Does anybody recognize where those come from? These are the three things that Charles Wesley and his brother came up with that eventually created the entire stream of Wesleyanism and Methodism. It was these three things that they brought about. Now, back at the time of Jesus, and, and we've talked about this at some level in Bible studies and other places, back at the time of Jesus in the Old Testament times, because Jesus is a Jew living in the Old Testament times initially, they had lots of rules to live by, right? The Jews did. In fact, God gave them like the Ten Commandments. We know those, right? We've read those. And God gave them some other commandments in the book of Leviticus and how to live their lives, how to go about doing things. Here's some rules, God said, to keep you out of trouble, the, the rules that can guide you in faith. But the problem is, when we're given rules, a lot of times, we make them more complex. We complexify them, right? You can quote me on that word. We make things more challenging rather than easier. <clears throat> we don't tend towards simplicity, but rather towards complexity. But we can, in faith, have some simple rules that can guide us in our faith. Now, in the Old Testament, we have a rule that was given to the Jews, a, a rule that was called the Shema. You might have heard this before, right? And this was something the Jews were to recite each and every day, something God's people were supposed to say every day to remind them of who they were and who God was. How many of you are familiar with the Shema? No? Oh, okay. Well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? That's Old Testament and New Testament, but that's what they were supposed to remind themselves every day. It's supposed to be the guiding underlying principle of all the decisions the Jews were supposed to make. But the problem was, in order to live that out, the religious leaders over time made this more and more complex. To the point at which by the time Jesus comes along, they have 613 different rules of law that they have to follow, that they have to do in order to be a good practicing Jew. That made it difficult for them. That made it challenging to actually practice the faith because you break a rule here, you break a rule there, and all of a sudden you're out of whack, and now you've got to take and make an extra sacrifice, all these kinds of things. And they had taken something that was really simple, given by God, and made it complicated. Now Jesus comes along, and along comes somebody who asks Jesus, Jesus, what is the most important rule? What is the most important law? Which of these 613 things that we're supposed to be doing, Jesus, should we prioritize as number one? And if you know your New Testament, Jesus simplified it, made it abundantly clear. You remember what Jesus said? Love God, love your neighbor, right? Love God and love your neighbor. Not 613 different things, I can't remember 613 things. I don't know about you, but I can't remember that. But can I remember love God and love neighbor? I think I could do that. 
We could use more of that in the world today, couldn't we? Love God and love your neighbor. How many of the problems in our world, even just from the last week, could love God and love neighbor change? A lot, right? I don't know if you're following the news, but in Minneapolis, only two hours away from us, so this is in our backyard, there was 120 people arrested last night in a protest. 27 police officers injured in Minneapolis. Okay? That's not far away, folks. That's us. It's not some abstract thing that we can say, well, yeah, that's Minneapolis and they're crazy down there. I mean, yes, they are, and that is Minneapolis, but that's not the point. That is Minnesota. That is us. Kim and I used to live just a couple miles from where all that protesting was going on. Kim used to teach in a school literally, literally a block away from where all of that went down. She taught there for a number of years. So that's personal. Love God. Love your neighbor, right? If we could get those two simple rules not a bunch of complexity, not a bunch of other stuff, just those two things that we boil it down. If we can get those two things right, we can faithfully be followers of Jesus and be a radiant light into our community, into our state, and into our world. Now, as I said, this idea, these three principles, come from John and Charles Wesley. Now, if you don't know John and Charles Wesley, of course, if you know hymns, they wrote a bunch of hymns. But they were a couple of brothers living in England um, who kind of looked at the church and said, I think there's a better way of doing this. I think, I think we could be more faithful if we give this some thought about how we live out our faith on a day-to-day -day way. And so... John and Charles sat down and they start practicing these, these simple principles. Pretty soon, the people who are around them are like, you guys are doing something different. I like it. Right? People saw that their lives were different. People saw that they were living differently for Jesus. Not, not because, you know, they were strutting down the street going, oh yeah, look at us. No, they were just living out their faith. Doing no harm, doing good and loving God and others. And pretty soon, the people who see the difference want to be part of the difference, right? Some people see this amazingness happening in their lives and they say, I want that too. That's the power of the gospel. We all have that capability within us. If we truly live loving God and loving others, People will see that. No, it might not happen right away. But if we keep doing it, if we keep being winsome, if we keep being loving, if we keep investing and keep inviting in other people in our lives, keep serving them, keep treating them as Jesus would have us treat them, keep forgiving them as Jesus has forgiven us, if we do that, pretty soon people start to realize, just like they did with the Wesley brothers, there's something different about that guy. That, 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 that lady is a little bit different than most of the people I encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. What makes them tick? When somebody is beginning to ask those questions, when somebody is beginning to wonder, why did you forgive me? Why did you love me? Why did you serve me? Why did you help me? Why did you give to me? When somebody begins asking those questions, folks, their heart is open for a gospel opportunity. You don't have to be the most great orator. You don't have to have all the Bible memorized. You don't have to have any special skill for that matter. When somebody comes to you and says, why did you love me? Why did you serve me? Why did you forgive me? When nobody else does. And your answer is Jesus. There's power. The answer is because I've been forgiven because I've been loved, because I was first served. I do this not for my benefit, but for yours. When, when people are asking that why question finally, they're ready. Jesus can do amazing things in their lives. And in that, this is what happened in the 1700s in England, the Wesleys start a movement. 
out of these three general rules. It wasn't their intent. They just wanted to live out their faith better. But pretty soon, they start collecting students from the college, and they start having to figure out, well, how do we sort and organize these guys? And they they put them into these small groups, and every day, these groups start getting together and spending time in prayer and spending time in service and spending time in reading the Word together. And pretty soon, more and more people see that, and they want to be part of it. And it just grows organically, but it grows exponentially. And it begins to have a huge, huge impact, far beyond what these two brothers just sitting around thinking about how do we live out our faith more effectively? Well, as I said, their answer was do no harm, do good, and stay in love with God. Now today, just like it was in the 1700s, the world is a confusing and broken place. The world is in a constant state of change. We know the world is changing faster now than it ever has before. The world is just faster and faster, quicker and quicker, changing. And with change, some good comes, but with change, some challenge comes. And it makes our lives complex. I remember when I was a kid, my choices were three television stations, right? And one of them, you kind of had to stand there holding the rabbit ears and lean over the TV in order to see what was on, right? Anybody have that system? Right? It's like if I wanted to watch Popeye, I had to watch it like this. Okay? And we had one TV, no remote. We didn't have cable. In fact, we didn't even have color. I'm old enough that we had black and white. I'm not that old. Am I? I don't know. Age is relative. But life has gotten much more complex. I didn't have a whole lot to worry about when I was a kid. There's a lot for kids to worry about today. So we're going to dig into these three things over the next couple of weeks and and really look to understand how can we live this out. Because if we can get these simple things right, folks, we can fundamentally change ourselves and change the world. The gospel is not complex. The gospel is not difficult, but actually applying it, living it, being Christ to the people around you, that takes a little bit more work, doesn't it? Along the way, we're going to fail. We're not always going to be perfect at loving others. We're not going to always be perfect at serving others. We're not going to always be perfect at giving to others but we're going to work at it and be intentional and try to grow and try to get better at it. Because as we do, my hope is we change the world. To help us understand what these rules meant, we're going to be, as I said, in Romans. If you want to open up Romans 12, I'll be reading these to you. Uh, Romans 12, uh, verses 14 through 19. And then we'll be in Romans 13 after that for a little second. But Romans 12, um, 14 through 19 says this. These are the words... Paul writes, but these are the authority of God. Paul writes these words, and he understood these words because Paul didn't always have the easiest go of things. And Paul writes, bless those who persecute you. That's a little different than our world, isn't it? Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Weep with those who weep. Paul says, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Okay, don't get too big for your britches, right? Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends upon you, live peaceably with all. Not most, not some, not those who are easy, but all, right? Beloved, Paul says, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. (coughs) Huh. Paul knew something about being persecuted. How about we jump down to Romans 13, 8 through 10, just probably another page over from where you're at. Paul gives us these instructions. Paul says, Owe 
no one anything except for love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Okay. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. Here's Paul saying, here's how you make that simple. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 10, love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is fulfilling the law. What we see here is a, a list of things that we know are wrong, Paul says. So we need to make sure we avoid those things, right? We don't murder. We don't covet. We don't hurt people. We, we, do, we don't commit adultery and those kinds of things. We don't lie. We don't cheat. We don't steal. Because we know those things are wrong and they hurt people, right? We don't gossip. We don't put unkind things on the internet, right? We shouldn't be saying unkind things about other people hiding behind a Facebook or Twitter account. But how often do we say things online? Or at least we see people, if you didn't say it, you might see it. Where people say something online that they would never, ever say to somebody else's face. Especially if they're big like me. Right? There's a lot of things people might say behind my back, but to my face, I'm a big guy. But people say all kinds of mean and hurtful and harmful things. Did you know that the number one cause of teen suicide is cyberbullying? How sad is that? Kids today are, are very connected. Text, Snapchat, some Twitter, some Facebook, probably some other things I don't even know about. And the number one cause of kids choosing to not want to any longer be part of this world is other people saying mean things about them online. Harmful, hurtful, often untrue things. It's a huge problem. And not just for teens, but for adults as well. I'm amazed and, and in fact horrified at how mean-spirited and how vicious people can be. People forget that words have power. Right? The Bible talks a lot about the power and strength of our words. The strongest muscle in your body, you might think, you know, hamstring or glutes. No. It's the tongue. Not because it lifts more weight, because it can inflict the most pain. The most powerful muscle in our body. And when we are tempted to say negative things or be mean or any of those kinds of things, we need to return back to these words. Do no harm. Now, what we begin to see in the book of Romans is a list of things that we should not do because they cause harm. But the Wesley's rule wasn't given so that we would make more and more lists of things to do. The Wesley's tried to boil this down just as Paul did, just as Jesus did, to give us a guide for our lives so that we could live in a straightforward way, so that we didn't have to overthink it, so that we could, as we leave the walls of the church, take with us something to make a difference in the world around us and how we affect others. So in the week to come, one of my challenges to you this week, maybe you feel your blood start to boil in a setting. Maybe somebody starts to get under your skin. Maybe it's in traffic. Maybe it's one of the places, I'll admit, one of my weaknesses is standing in line at checkout lines. Oh my goodness. If God convicted us on sin in checkout lines, I'm never getting to heaven. Right? I mean, I try to pick which line's going to be the fastest and quickest, and then inevitably I pick the one where somebody's writing a check. Oh. Checks. Now, should a, should a check be a reason for sinning? No. But I'm impatient. I want to get to wherever I'm going. and I don't want to be standing in line here. I know that. I can only look at the People magazine cover for so long, right? I can only be tempted by the candy that they always stick there for just so long. I don't want to get out of there. 
But this week when our, our passions, our emotions are running high, and you know what your trigger points are, hopefully, but when you reach that trigger point, maybe it's that person in the office who drives you nuts. Maybe it's that cousin that you have who just, boy, their politics stink. Maybe it's that, that neighbor that you just, I can't believe the way he mows his lawn. He's wrong. Right? Or maybe it's something more serious than that. Maybe it's a kid of yours who just pushes your buttons. A spouse who, man, we just can't seem to get along. But when our passions start to get high this week, when our emotions start to bubble over, when we start to feel that creep up the back of our necks, you ever feel that? I feel that in those moments of tension. Let us pause. Let us think, are my words and actions going to reflect Jesus? Can I, in this situation, do no harm? Do no harm. Three words. If you can remember those three words this week, it can change your relationships. Just do no harm. Sometimes that means a little bit of harm, a bite in your own tongue. But do no harm. Because here's the thing, when we want to retaliate, when we want to lash out, what I've learned in this world is hurt people hurt people, don't they? Right? But we should be living by a different set of rules, folks. We, we follow Jesus, the guy who died on the cross for our sins. We are forgiven people. Now, hurt people hurt people, but what do forgiven people do? Forgiven people forgive people. And that sometimes is hard. But remember back to what I was saying? When we forgive when somebody's not expecting it, that's the power of the gospel. And it has the power to change people's lives. So this week, when we're feeling the stress and strain of life, Somebody cuts us off in traffic or whatever. Do no harm. Okay? Keep that in mind. Will I reflect Jesus and what I'm going to do? Because here's the deal. All people, every person is precious in God's sight. Every person deserves to be treated with dignity. Deserves to be loved, even if they're not loving towards us. We have to have healthy boundaries. But... All people are created in the image and likeness of God. Not most, not some, but all. And if every person, every person is a precious child in God's eyes, if every person is loved by God, and they are, the Bible's really clear about that, even the ones we don't like, then we've got to love them too. I'm telling you, folks, if we can figure this out, the world can be changed by a small group of people. John and Charles Wesley were just two college-age guys. How many of you have ever seen a Methodist or Wesleyan church in the world? Yeah? They're all over the place. They had no idea that's what was going to happen. They just said, we're going to follow Jesus. We're going to live by these three simple rules. And by living by three simple rules in their life, by doing it day after day and then sharing it with others, Look at their legacy. Can you imagine having a legacy like that? You never know. Just be faithful. I'm going to jump ahead here so we can finish up. I have to occasionally tell our sound booth people where I'm at because I don't always follow my own script. Part of all of this and this is an important thing for us to understand. And Paul referenced this. Part of all of this is trusting in God. Whose vengeance is it? Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. When we are hurt, when we are harmed, when the world's not nice, when somebody doesn't treat us like we'd like to be treated, Jesus says, turn the other cheek. When we're lied to, 
when we're stabbed in the back, when our stuff is broken, when we've been cheated, when our stuff is stolen. What does Jesus say? Peter comes and says, how many times do we have to forgive him, Jesus? Seven? Right, so, so if somebody kicks me in the shin seven times, Jesus, on the eighth, can I kick him back? Right? What does Jesus say? Well, Jesus' answer is basically, why are you counting? Just keep forgiving. Jesus' answer is no, not seven. Seven times 70. The number isn't important. The, the point of it is, just keep forgiving. Eventually, his leg's going to get tired and he's going to wonder why this guy keep letting me kick him. Well, maybe. But if we keep forgiving, if we keep loving, if we keep serving, if we keep investing, if we keep giving, we keep creating opportunities for us to share the gospel with the people around us. And it requires in that for us to trust God knowing that he is in control of that situation. We may not get the retribution that we want. We may not get the revenge that we want. But that is not ours, says the Lord. And this is where the simple rule of do no harm comes into practice. And as I mentioned, practice is harder than principle. Love God, love others. It is that simple. Sometimes loving God can be hard. And sometimes loving others can be difficult. But if we consciously make those choices each and every day of our lives, I promise you, not because I have authority, but because it's the authority of the Bible to promise you, if you love God and you love others radically each and every day, you're going to change the world. You're going to change your relationship with your kids, with your spouse, with your neighbors, with their teachers, with your coworkers, with the community, and into the world. I believe we can change the world, folks. That is the power of the gospel. I do not think I'm naive in that because I've seen that change happen in amazing ways. Let's be part of the change. Let's love others and love God radically and then let God sort the rest of it out. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.